I, I'm looking at, trying to read the signs at the times and thinking today might not be the most encouraging time for priests or sometimes for Catholics or Christians in general. You know, there's the, the churches are emptying and graying partly and um, um, the sexual abuse crisis and different things that can easily discourage us. Or I don't think there's a family, uh, Catholic family or Christian family where somebody isn't practicing and you say like, or for instance, the United States right now, the largest Christian denomination in the United States right now are Roman Catholics, and the second largest is ex-Roman Catholics who no longer go to church. So it's easy to be discouraged, especially for priests. And so my view is to, to try to pull out metaphors and images from Scripture. I call it, just, you know, nurturing metaphors to help to sustain the priests in their faith, their hope, and so on, and to know that the church has been in this place before. The church has been in much worse shape than this before. And uh, it's like the resurrection. The stone always rolls over and Jesus re-emerges. And uh, uh, every time God is declared dead, God makes a marvelous resurrection. <laughs> and this is no, no different this time. What are the, the problems that we struggle with culturally, ecclesially, socially, and so on, that are, in, in the, again, in the Western world, or, or secularized world? So, you know, there's secularized parts like in Asia, everything, Japan to Australia or whatever, it's the North, uh, South Korea, and so on. Some of those places are very, very highly secularized, you know, um, Hong Kong, so on. Um, the first one is that we, we struggle with what I call the agnosticism and even atheism of everyday consciousness. So it's not that we're atheists or agnostics um, because we go to church on Sunday, we believe, but we are in our everyday consciousness. See, the consciousness of the marketplace, of the, the sports field, of whatever, um, is, is, is pretty agnostic. And then we, we crank up God in prayer and on the side, you know, but we don't spontaneously think of God. I'll give you a simple example. Tom Groom is a friend of mine at Sheriff's that said, when he was a young kid growing up in Ireland, you know, 1950s, he got pneumonia. And very, very serious, but they were living in a small town. His dad was gone for the week. His mother had no telephone, no car, no doctors. So you know what she did? She pinned a relic of Teresa, the little flower, onto his pajamas and knelt by his bed and prayed, told God, I'm not gonna leave till you cure my son. And they both fell asleep and they woke up, his fever was gone. Now, not necessarily that he's claiming a miracle, but the point Tom makes is that today we wouldn't even think of doing that. You know, you, you wouldn't think of pinning a relic of a saint. You know, you, you can only think of doctors and, you know, um, we have a very, very different consciousness. That, that's one. And it's not that it's all bad. It's just it simply makes religious st struggle. Some of the other ones are more obvious. Like, for instance, the polarization. We live in a highly polarized church, highly polarized churches highly polarized culture, politics, take the contemporary election. I mean, we, we can't even talk civilly to each other. And that's inside of church circles. Um, that's a major struggle, you know. And the third thing, partly fired by that is, we, we also are deeply, all of us, ideologically infected. To, by that, that I mean that um, it's hard for us when we're honest to even at, to, to admit that we don't know when we're sincere or not. Um, so a simple example. A few years ago when the, that movie came out, The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, and there was such a fierce reaction, you know, liberals, conservatives, the greatest movie, worst movie, greatest movie. I was convinced nobody even watched the movie. We watched each other watch the movie, see, and we reacted to each other. You know, we, we, and, and you see it all the time that it's, it's so hard. If somebody says to me, what do you really think about this or that? What do you really think of this political stance, or what do you think of this? The honest answer for most of us have to be, I don't know. I know what I'm supposed to think, depending what circle I'm with, and so on, you know. Then fourthly, and again, not a secret, we struggle as a culture, not just at churches, all cultures, massively with sexuality, you know. Um, and it's not so much that the churches are bad or whatever. Um, the churches, <laughs> we don't have to answer, neither does anybody else. But see, our culture really struggles, and so do all, all cultures struggle with sexuality. But our culture struggles, maybe I can put it in a little formula for you. See, um, I'm convinced the church understands purity and doesn't understand passion, and the world understands passion and doesn't understand purity. 
and we're not going to have a healthy sexuality we can we can get those two together so that we struggle on two sides of the equation and i mean i'm not just talking about the churches that we we either struggle with frigidity coldness or or we struggle in denial and there's so much denial about sexuality or we struggle with there are no rules and there are no guidelines and there are you know like like we we haven't it and, and this is massive like you know like in, in our culture um, and in all cultures um, but but today because we with the media sexuality is so present inside of everything you know so we're in a very sexualized culture without a lot of help to sort this out you know um, I don't want to blame the churches because I still think we're healthier than <laughs> it's not like we're, we're a bad church inside of a very healthy society you know we're struggling but society is really really struggling you know um, I'll give you an example. A reputable, very reputable psychiatrist told me that. For instance, he said that, see, with teenage suicides today, he said he would estimate in 90% of the cases because of sexual abuse. You know, see, so um, um, it, it's 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 a struggle. It's a massive thing. Um, you know, there there are others, but these are some of the 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 major. Um, you know, we struggle with prayer, um, and again, the reason why we struggle with prayer is that because we're so efficiency oriented that you know like okay you're a busy person you feel guilty about every minute you're not doing something that's useful see in prayer by definition is is useless prayer by definition is non utilitarian you know and so we're so busy and we're so pragmatically driven that it becomes hard for us to ever just stop for you to do nothing you say well I should be at least shopping for groceries or doing something. You know, Merton once get a great line. Some journalist asked Merton, and the journalist said to him, what do you consider the leading spiritual disease in the West? And of all the things he might have said, you know, no justice or sexuality or something, he didn't use anything. He said, efficiency, pragmatism. He said, from the White House down to the nursery, the plant has to run. And by the time you keep the plant running, there's no time or focus or energy for anything else. So we struggle deeply. I mean, it's made us the most efficient culture. Take technology, you know. Um, all the new technological information, you know, I don't want to say gadgets, but you know, machines and so on. They are making us the most connected, informed, intelligent people ever, but they may also drive us crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of, we are completely connected and and to ever stop like people can't go on a vacation anymore P people can't even meet together anymore I, I travel a lot in airports at any given time 80 percent of the people in airports are sitting around lounges looking at a screen um, you know it's changing our culture uh, and not all for the bad you know i'm not a, not a prophet of doom to say this is terrible it's um uh, like I said, it's making us wonderfully efficient, wonderfully connected. Um, sometimes I get worried about some of the advertising about this because it, it gives people the impression that life somehow um, means that you got to be 30 seconds ahead of the next guy. <laughs> Remember those ads where you say, well, I was so 15 seconds ago. It's like, you know, Peter, I got 15 seconds ahead of you <laughs> and knowing this event. You know, it's not life changing. Um, and it, it kind of feeds into some of our narcissism. Um, but I'm, not more, I'm more worried about simply that, um, that for so many people, we can't stop it, you know. And I don't know how parents work with their kids in terms of screen time. Like, uh, you know, like uh, how do you limit it? How, and how do you get kids to go out and play and to read Alice in Wonderland and do some other stuff when they got two screens in their hand all the time? Uh, again, it's not bad. It's like eating. Eating is a good thing, but you got to know when to pull away from the smog, you know. Um, you need one example, you know, in fact, it's the one I started with. If you take the metaphor and scripture of the desert, you know, the Israelites were in the desert for 40 years, um, didn't know how they were going to get out of there, uh, and then eventually when they do get out of there, they conquer the promised land, but while they're there, it's depressing, it's kind of discouraging, they're, they seem to be going around in circles, um, and yet God is working in a deep way during this time. What's well, the same right now? Many many analysts would say today the church is in the desert, which is not a bad place to be. It's a frustrating place to be. It's a painful place to be. Um, but 
while we're there, stuff is happening on the surface like a plant that you're not seeing that the, the shoots come up yet, but stuff is happening. It's taking in nutrients, it's doing, it's developing itself and so on. So this, is, it, this isn't the time of spectacular growth for the church in the West, though incidentally it is in Africa and Asia and some of the other places. Uh, incidentally in Africa, Roman Catholicism in one generation, a little more than one generation, has grown from a million Catholics to a hundred million Catholics. Uh, that's just in our lifetime. That's incredible. I mean, uh, see, so that there are places where the church is undergoing spectacular growth and it's young. And then there's places like the West and secularized cultures where it's, um, it seems that the church is in decline, particularly in Western Europe, less so in the United States. But even in the United States, as I, I said, you know, the, the second largest denomination in the United States are ex-Catholics. Um, but even there, there's, there's, there's rerouting, there's wonderful growth that is, that's developing. What we're supposed to do with these things, uh, that's in our Christian tradition, it's in our scriptures and so on. So for instance, the speed thing and, and technology, the answer lies in the Sabbath. You know, uh, right from day seven, when this planet was created, <laughs> God, God made the whole idea is, you can do this for six days a week and one day a week, you're supposed to shut it all off, you know, and then you're, you'll be healthy. The trouble is we can't do it. Notice how in our culture we're losing Sunday. Sunday is just turning into another day, except you get the privilege and pleasure of watching football that day. But I mean, it's, it's busy and driven and driven. Um, see, so one of the answers in scripture, for instance, is Sabbath. They say, no matter what you're doing, Peter, your job, your technology, is one day a week, shut it all down, and you'll just be happier, you'll be healthier, you'll be more rested, and you'll have more perspective on your life. You know, uh, you just have to stop it. Um, but in, in every area, that we, we have answers, and I want to be sympathetic to our culture, we have answers, it's just that they're very difficult to live. It's like dieting, I know what I shouldn't eat, it's just the dessert's there. Um, you know, we, we, we do have answers. It's not so much like we're searching for answers, like what do I do? Um, we're searching for the strength to do them, you know? Um, and especially, and this, you know, and I say this very sympathetically, especially it's very, very difficult to, to do them alone. You know, um, in terms of, see, we, we, we need the old expression, it takes a village to raise a child. It also takes a community to live Christianity. You know, that, uh, for instance, if you have kids and, and some running shoe comes out that's no better than anything else, but it costs $300, but everybody in school gets it, you're going to end up buying it for your kid, you know, because your kid can't be the one kid who hasn't got it. Um, see, so that so much of this we need support. We somehow, uh, you can't be the one person in your whole network who shuts down his technology for one day a week. If the others don't do, you know, somehow, you know, we got to, you know, we used to observe Sabbath together. Everybody stopped working. Everybody went to church. Everybody, you know, see, uh, so community is, a, is another big struggle that we have to, so many of these answers, we have the answers, you know what we should do? They're very difficult to live and they're particularly difficult to live if you're alone. Um, that, um, you know, remember an expression that I got in sociology as an undergraduate, which I very much liked and talked about somebody being uh, a cognitive deviant. <laughs> I love that expression. So that you're, 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 as a thinker, you're a deviant. Now, I'll give you an example. When I was a kid, I grew up in an immigrant area on Sunday, doesn't matter, Roman Catholic, everybody went to church. And you had to be a cognitive deviant to not go to church. Today, my nephews and nieces, the opposite. You know, they live in situations in colleges and so on that if they're going to go to church on Sunday, they've got to be a cognitive deviant to go. You know? Or it used to be you were a cognitive deviant if you worked on Sunday. Now you're a cognitive deviant if you don't work on Sunday. See, so that uh, there's a real struggle there, the community, we no longer have to, the community no longer carries the faith for you. It doesn't carry the good habits for you. Now, and that puts a lot more pressure. So in that sense, the mature Christian today has to be much more inner-directed. You know, you have to be much more, whether anybody else is doing it, you've got to do it, and, and it's hard to do it alone. Um, that's why Karl Rahner, I'll give you a great line, Karl Rahner said this generation ago, he says, in the future you'll either be a mystic or you'll be an unbeliever. 
and by mystic, he didn't mean you're not mystical experience. He meant that you're going to have to really ground it personally for yourself, or you're not going to have it because the family, the community is not going to carry it for you. See, where the church is new and establishing itself, it's always very, very powerful. And see where it's struggling is once it gets established. Uh, let me give you a little formula on that. You know, it's interesting. We, in North America, I've come from Canada, but we have the same experience. Uh, you know, we're immigrant churches. And in the immigrant church, we know how to be Catholic when we're poor and undereducated and marginalized. And churches work well. We don't know how to be Catholic when we're affluent, educated, and mainstream. Because it's new to us, you know. We've, we've, it's only now, really, Kennedy was the elected president in 1961 or something. It was the first time, say, an American Catholic became president. See, it was the first time a Catholic had emerged to kind of that level. But, you know, Kennedy, that generation was the first generation of educated Catholics and so on. But just that simple formula, we know how to do it if we're poor, undereducated, and marginalized. We struggle, because nobody showed us, how do you be a Catholic and keep community and Catholic community together when we're affluent, educated, and mainstream? And that's really, in many ways, the task of your generation, my generation, it's something you're going to have to show your kids, you know, how, to, how do you do that? And, and they're going to be unconscious, unconsciously watching you.